that's some of the things going on in the world. Then I want to come back uh, just uh, quickly here to this uh, Iowa issue and uh, the uh, Supreme Court's decision. You know, I've been involved in this for a long time. Robert B. Hansen, the judge in Polk County, that issued the first opinion. That was, that was August 30th of 2007. And I turned my focus on it then. I put a lot of energy into this for a state issue since I've gone to Washington. It's the thing I've put far more energy into than any other state issue. And Highway 20 is a state and federal issue, sure. Uh, and, and, and everybody else in this room that agrees with us on that issue. But uh, so I've been working this pretty hard. And I will tell you that I'm, I'm, I'm the non lawyer on the Judiciary Committee in the House of Representatives. It, I think it gives me an advantage. I only have to argue one side of the issue, not both. But after having, <laughs> you know, but after having uh, gone through these arguments, I'm in my 13th year of sitting on a judiciary committee, battling with all this, and I've always cared about the law, the rule of law, and the Constitution. So um, this education is, I had a foundation, and then I build on that foundation. And, and what I, this is an outrageous decision on the part of the courts. It cannot be, it cannot be considered any other way. They went, I, I wrote this down a little bit so I would get it right. Here's one of the things that's in that decision, and, and it is a quote. They held that, quote, our responsibility is to protect rights of individuals even when the rights were unimagined. These judges are so arrogant that, that they believe that they have extrasensory perception. They can find rights in the Constitution that were not even imagined until they do find them. Now, they were imagined by the people who brought the spoof, but I don't think they imagined there was language within the Constitution that was written in there for the purpose of protecting people, uh, two guys or two gals, so that they could get married and say they did so under the Constitution <coughs> state of mind. Um, this is that's just it is a breathtaking decision. They were, they were arrogant enough to say, we really respect the separation of powers, um, we approach this resolution of this case with a keen and respectful understanding of our Constitution and the vital roles of the three branches of government as well as the role of people. But they said this is our role, our role exclusively, not the legislature, not the executive, and not the people. And they also said that they're better suited to deal with marriage than the legislature because the legislature can be emotional and make decisions that are emotional rather than logical or rational without having enough sensitivity towards people's rights. And then they also said that this is the, this, this case turned on the Equal Protection Clause, which mirrors the federal constitution, but it's in the state constitution. They held that, and this is a quote, equal protection can only be defined by the standards of each generation. Close quote. So they will figure out, the judges will, with their extrasensory judicial perception, this equal protection standard that is for the new generation, not from the old generation. But I will tell you, Iowa law is this generation, not a generation or two or ten ago. We passed that law when I was in the Iowa Senate in 98. And it says marriage shall be only between one male and one female. And my language as it was, I didn't want to say a man and a woman because I don't want to get into a debate on what the difference was between a man and a woman. If somebody steps up and says, I'm the man, and the other one says, I'm the woman, well then, you'll make the argument that we considered that when we wrote the law, and that just they each had to declare which one the other one was, even though they were the same sex. Uh, a male and a female is what someone independent can verify you are, not what someone believes they are inside. That's, that's why you've seen the word gender be threaded through our dialogue and Almost everything, every application you have now, we don't put sex, male, female, we go gender. Because gender is what you think you are. Sex is what a doctor can determine you are. Um, but and that's part of this whole dialogue that's going on. It is a very activist decision. They also found that it is better to raise children in a same-sex home. Now, that's our Supreme Court. The, the terror of it, ivory tower attitude of our Iowa Supreme Court with a universal seven to nothing decision. Think how this works. I'm not going to cast any aspersions upon how this came about being a unanimous decision. I will just tell you that there was a body of legal thought back in the 70s that would point to potentially controversial Iowa Supreme Court decisions that seemed to be uh, consistently unanimous. Think how that works. 
if they're all together, they work together, and if they decide that it's going to be a unanimous decision, then no one writes a dissent. If no one writes a dissent, then we, the people, don't have any legal authorities language to go to and say, I agree with the dissent. I think the majority was wrong. There's, there is no dissent out there on record because it was a unanimous decision. And so I know that there were a lot of attorneys in the 70s that thought that's what happened with the Iowa Supreme Court. I just, it causes me to think. And another thing that causes me to think is that Justice Katie, the Republican who was appointed by Branstad, wrote the opinion. Now, if the Republican writes the opinion, it makes it harder also to criticize the opinion. I have no restraint, though. I mean, I, I have, my staff went down through and analyzed all of that, and we do have legal counsel on our staff and good legal counsel. I am only a third of the way through it, and this is, these are the things I told you that I pulled out of it, not what they gave me. But this is a far-reaching decision, and I called for these justices, if they want to legislate, they should step down from the bench, resign, and run for office and go to the legislature if they want to, if they want to change this. So strategically, what has to happen is the question, how do we get this done? I want to set aside that Supreme Court decision. And I would be happy to do it yesterday or last week if there's a way to do it. I think it needs to happen as soon as possible. The one, the course we have that that is clear to everyone, I think, is to pass a constitutional amendment to restate the language that we put in the law in 1998, only put it in the Constitution this time. Mary shall be between only one male and one female in Iowa. Um, but according to the Iowa Constitution, we amend it by, it, it takes, first it would have to pass this General Assembly. Then we'd have to have an intervening election in November 2010. Then we would see a new General Assembly after that election. They would also have to pass the same language, identical. And then it could go on the ballot for a vote of the people. The best I can hope for, and I said earlier I'm an optimist, uh, would be to get it on the ballot, the Constitutional Amendment, in June 2011. And that's if this General Assembly passes it. You have Mike Gronstall, the majority leader in the Iowa Senate, who said he will block everything that comes at him. He will take whatever he is necessary to prevent the people from getting a vote on marriage. Pat Murphy has said the same thing. And both of them, Pat Murphy is the Speaker of the Iowa House, both of them um, have, have joined together in a statement that applauds this decision by the Supreme Court. And most of the rest of us have rejected it. Uh, so they're there. Pat Murphy has procedurally already blocked a vote on the floor of the House last Thursday. They're engaged in this debate today. I don't know if it's actually a debate in caucus today. I don't know that it's out on the floor. I'm trying to find another way to force a vote so that at least we can put your representatives on record. If they can do that, the pressure could go to the Senate to put your senators on record. I think most of the people in the western part of the state are going to be okay. Most of your representatives are going to be okay. Um, and beyond what I am, on the same side that I am, and I perceive most of you are. Uh, but the, the balance of the strategy, there are some people down there that they want to create a constitutional crisis. And they are arguing that they want to just put the Defense of Marriage Act, the law, the statute, on an amendment to any bill and then pass it again and just keep doing that over and over again. I think Culver vetoes anything that has that on it. And I, I think he does that because he said now that he's, he's not going to support a constitutional amendment between a man and a woman. Although, a year ago, January, January 19th, he said, we'll do whatever it takes to protect marriage between a man and a woman. Um, so then, Governor Cole. And uh, that was January 19th. We'll do whatever it takes to protect marriage between a man and a woman. Um, let's see. He said, but let's see, also, the court, if the court upholds lower court ruling in favor of gay marriage, the legislature can and should respond quickly. That's January 19th. That was Iowa Press, January 19th, 2008. Of course, you know what he said today, and I don't have that quote in front of me, but it, it is that the Supreme Court has ruled, and uh, he's reluctant to promote a constitutional amendment. Since then, he's backed up even further. And I think most people read him as an opponent to a constitutional amendment. So I think he vetoes whatever might come through that would restate the Defense of Marriage Act that's in the Iowa Code today.